Morning, Johnny. How are you, bud? Good morning, guys. How we doing? Doing well, John. Still buzzing from the game on Saturday night, which Amazing. was just unbelievable. John, where are you putting that in terms of greatest games in college basketball history on the men's side? You know, it's definitely in the conversation for sure. You know, so many people were so quick to immediately connect it to the Duke-Kentucky game that the three of us all grew up with in 1992. I think, you know, the big difference for me is that, you know, Duke-Kentucky was a battle of a one versus a two seed. This was a one seed going for a perfect season against a team in UCLA that for all intents and purposes, people have to remember, was in the first four and again, lost three projected starters from the team it thought it was going to have. So just the fact that UCLA was able to get to that point and get to the point at the end of regulation where they had the ball with the chance to win again is just an, an incredible testament to the job that Mick Cronin did with his team. He is. I mean, it just, I mean, the, the fact that UCLA averaged 1.55 points per possession for those analytics people out there, I mean, a remarkably efficient offensively. Going up against the Gonzaga team, I mean, they were historically good when you look at their offensive efficiency during the course of the regular season. And, you know, still a lot from Jay Billis, I think he said it perfectly, um, which is this, John, you know, UCLA would have beaten any other team in the country other than Gonzaga. I mean, that's the only team in the country that would have beaten them uh, by the way and how well UCLA and Mick Cronin played on Saturday night. Yeah, and the guys, the thing that I think we're seeing is this, and, you know, late on Saturday night, you know, the hotel where I was doing my postgame reports for was obviously in the bubble, and I saw a lot of the UCLA staff, and we were talking late into the early morning hours of Sunday morning. And, you know, the thing that I think we're seeing is that, like, there are opportunities to score and trade baskets with Gonzaga. The hard part is stopping them, and that is something that is twofold because, you know, in talking to Baylor staff today, you know, getting ready for tonight's game, you obviously know that you have to try and limit their easy baskets. You can't turn the ball over. You can't give them layups. But it takes an efficient offensive team to be able to trade baskets and score with them at the pace that they score at. I mean, UCLA got 90 points and didn't win. Yeah, and and, and you know what? Like, I was kind of hoping – I know it was a crazy ending and sucks with the game winner. I was almost hoping for a second overtime because I really didn't yeah. want the game to end, and that's how right. good it was. And you look at Suggs, and like I know Gonzaga obviously has a national profile now. They are recruiting with the best of the best in college basketball. John, but what would a win tonight do for that program? Well, it, to me, it's not just Gonzaga winning a national championship. It's completing a perfect season for the first time since, obviously, 1976. And, look, Mark Few will obviously be the first person to tell you that he is not going to let a national championship define you know, what he does and the way he does things, and that's fine, but – this is a championship or bust situation for Gonzaga, and I don't think there's any way around it. Gonzaga has to win a national championship. They were obviously in a scenario four years ago where they almost won a national title against North Carolina. They came up a little bit short, and now we're in a situation where I know it's obviously the most anticipated national title game that we have seen in quite some time, in my opinion, in 16 years since Carolina played Illinois, but it's national title or bust for Gonzaga. All right, what well, you mentioned you were chatting with the Baylor staff earlier, John. What can Baylor do tonight? We know they're a good defensive team. The three-guard rotation that they've got for Drew at the top, they're really, really good. Um, and they're a three-point shooting team, and they're an efficient three-point shooting team as well. We've been waiting for this matchup all season long. What are the positives? If Baylor wins tonight, what do the Baylor Bears need to do? Well, the first thing, like we said, we have to see Baylor be in a situation where they don't turn the ball over, which they did obviously a great job of against Houston, and they're also efficient offensively, and they can't give up easy baskets. You know, when I look at Baylor's scenario, and I look at Bar Baylor's situation, nobody talks about this, I think, you know, enough, but they had 23 assists on 29 made field goals on Saturday against Houston. That is the elite of the elite. And on top of this, guys, if there is one obviously, I think, weakness on Gonzaga, it's limited depth. The only two guys that are coming in off the bench for Gonzaga and playing are Aaron Cook and Anton Watson. Look at what Baylor brings in off the bench. Adam Flagler, Matthew Meyer, and also Jonathan Chamwa Chachua combined for 30 points and 13 rebounds against Houston. To me, Baylor has eight starters, and that's where I think, you know, Baylor has an advantage is their bench is better than Gonzaga's bench. I mean, you can't come into this game 
on two different types of trajectories, like considering the final four. You have Baylor basically just walk over, easy game for the easy, I'll put that easy for me to say, but not a close game in their final four. Meanwhile, you have UCLA and Gonzaga overtime game winner, you know, places crazy. I mean, does how each of these teams, like are you worried about maybe the beginning of the game tonight, a little bit of a letdown here from Gonzaga, or is it going to be a little bit of a shock here for Baylor? I mean, what are you seeing early on? Well, you know, I, I would spend some time yesterday, you know, in uh, around Baylor's players. And, you know, I talked about Jalen Suggs and Joel Ayayi. And, you know, they were going to give those guys, I think, you know, all of Saturday night and Sunday morning to obviously enjoy the UCLA game. And then they were going to refocus and get ready for Baylor because it's another monumental task. And I think, you know, sometimes that's the hard thing about the quick turnaround in the NCAA tournament. You can only enjoy a victory so long if you have another game to play and look, I mean, the pressure right now is all on Gonzaga, just as it was on Saturday. And, you know, I think that's an advantage for Baylor for sure. When you look at Baylor, John, is Baylor back defensively to where they were pre COVID break uh, for that program? Because they were unbelievable defensive team. After that, they were atrocious defensively. Where is Baylor and their defensive efficiency going into the game tonight? They look to me, Moose and Maggie, you know, the other night like they did before they had a pause due to COVID-19 because Baylor early in the season, and I think you really saw it here in Indianapolis in the Jimmy V Classic against Illinois, was just ruthless defensively. And that's how they're going to have to be. And look, you know, he's not getting the attention of even Jared Butler or even, you know, Jalen Suggs, but Davion Mitchell has had an unbelievable NCAA tournament. And if Baylor was a snake, this guy would be the head. His defense on the perimeter and also the defense that Baylor is going to play on Corey Kispert, I think is going to be a critical, critical element in this game. Baylor has to do two things. Baylor has to limit self-inflicted wounds. And they also have to have a game where they're going to play an efficient brand of offense. Because here's the thing. We saw Baylor beat Villanova in the mud. We saw Baylor kind of not have a great offensive game, but still their defense carried them against Villanova. You need more than great defense to beat Gonzaga because if Gonzaga has a bad offensive day, they're still going to get 70 or 75 points. We mentioned what this would do for the Gonzaga program in terms of championship or bust. I mean, Baylor's still looking for their first national title on the men's side also so this would be huge for them too. call it john i mean who you got tonight what does it look like i mean p- p- lay, lay this out for us does does gonzaga complete the undefeated season i'm gonna take gonzaga 75 70 just too much offense just just too much offense like look i, I thought and and this is this is one thing that i thought i was watching the game when ucla had the ball when johnny juzing had the ball at the end of regulation you know, I said to myself, if there's ever going to be a chance for a miraculous upset, it's now because this that was the one time where Gonzaga wouldn't have been able to get the ball back. Right. Now and that was the big thing that I said to myself. So I said once we once it went to overtime, I said there's no chance. And you know, I thought that, you know, that, that was UCLA's best opportunity. And obviously they obviously battled back. They got down five in overtime and kept battling back. But I think Baylor at some point in this game, I don't I'm not concerned about their defense. I think it's more it's having the droughts offensively. And that's why I point back to Flagler and Matthew Meyer. These guys are, if, they, if Flagler, Matthew Meyer, and Chamwa Chachua can again get 30 plus, I think they'll have an outstanding chance to win. You know, John, historically, you mentioned that this is the most anticipated national title game in 16 years, Carolina, Illinois, right? So you look at tonight, yep. the victory for Gonzaga. We know they've got history on the line. You mentioned pressure uh, earlier in the interview that's all on, all on the Zags tonight. What would a victory tonight? I'm talking about not just for that program. I'm talking about where would you put this undefeated season for Gonzaga in historical perspective? You have to put them in the conversation of being obviously one of the best teams in the history of college basketball. But, you know, I'll be honest. I I thought more and more, I think, yesterday because I saw what UCLA did. We have seen other teams in the NCAA tournament rip through the tournament and not be obviously push like Gonzaga was against UCLA the other night. Like the 2018 Villanova team destroyed their opposition in the NCAA tournament. I look back to some of Billy Donovan's Florida teams, the two that won back-to-back national titles. They destroyed their opposition in the NCAA tournament. Roy Williams' second national championship at North Carolina with the team that had Tyler Hansborough destroyed their opposition. You could say the same about Rick Pitino's 96 team at Kentucky. So 
I look at, you know, obviously the fact that Gonzaga is going to go down in history if they win this game. But teams also that have won the national title that have had just a handful of losses have still been just as dominant or not more dominant. And that's what I think, you know, makes the game the other night again to this next generation, what Duke Kentucky was for us in 92. John Rothstein, our guest. John, away from this game for a moment, obviously the news about Roy Williams retiring the Hall of Fame coach. So now that's a massive opening for the Tar Heels. First off, who are some candidates you're hearing? But secondly, how what, what's the urgency to get this spot filled? We saw Texas didn't waste a lot of time with Chris Beard now from Texas Tech is going to take over for the Longhorns. Is, is North Carolina feeling a lot of urgency to get this spot filled quickly? I think if you have any head coaching opening this year, you're feeling urgency to get things opening because with immediate eligibility right now for all players once in their college career, the longer you wait, the greater chance there is that things are going to get off the rails when it comes to your program. From everything I've gathered, I think it's highly unlikely that North Carolina hires somebody outside its basketball family. Remember, the last coach to coach at North Carolina without ties to the school before getting the job was Frank McGuire, who preceded Dean Smith at North Carolina. It's about 70 years ago. To me, the two top candidates are still assistant coach Hubert Davis and UNC Greensboro's Wes Miller, both played at North Carolina, and I would expect North Carolina to move swiftly. I would be shocked if the Tar Heels do not name a head coach this week. John, we've seen a lot on the coaching carousel. Quick thoughts here. Beard in Texas, you think it works? You think Porter Moser leaving Loyola Chicago going to Oklahoma, you think that works? It was the time for Porter Mosier to leave. I know he obviously was extremely, extremely connected to the city of Chicago. He loved it there. He loved his, you know, regular seats at Wrigley Field and so on and so forth. But he had been clamoring for a power conference, you know, opportunity. He's going to work for one of the great ADs in college sports and Joe Castiglione. He replaces a legend in Lon Kruger. I think that, you know, that marriage is going to fit like a shoe. And look, you know, Chris Beard, you know, took Texas Tech to an elite eight and to a national title game where, you know, Texas tech was one stop away from winning the national title. And with all due respect to Texas tech's program, they operated before he got there in sheer obscurity. So now you put him obviously at a brand like Texas. And I would expect as long as Chris Beard is the head coach of Texas will be a top 10 or 15 team every single season. You know, John, one more tonight on the game, and, and that is Gonzaga. When, you know, we, we all obviously NBA is big in this city. When you look at this at Gonzaga team, there's a lot of people that look at them and say, you know, five, they've got five NBA players on this team. You think there are five guys that take the court tonight for the Zags that NBA fans are going to be seeing in the not-so-distant future playing in the association? I don't know if they're longtime pros, but look, Jalen Suggs is a lottery pick. Corey Kispert's a spinning image of Joe Harris. I mean, Drew Timmy, again, continues to show how efficient he is offensively. And then, you know, to me, guys, the afterthoughts are Joel Ayayi, who carried them in the start of the game on Saturday night. And Andrew Nemhard, you know, nobody talks about Andrew Nemhard at all for Gonzaga. This guy was the starting point guard and led Florida, Florida, in minutes played last year before transferring. But again, it's not so much the starters for Gonzaga yeah. tonight that are the key to the game. It's the bench. Baylor has a decisive advantage on the bench. My last one for you, John, is just going back to the coaching ranks. Roy Williams retires. I mean, there's other guys out there, obviously Hall of Fame coaches who are part of the older guard. Coach K, Bayheim. I mean, what do you think about those two specifically? And do you think, I mean, they can't coach forever. Are retirements maybe imminent for those two legendary coaches? I mean, it's something that I think we all have to look at, you know, in the next couple of years that there's going to be a changing of the guard. And look, sports are different right now. Sports are a lot different. So we're going to take it, you know, inch by inch, day by day. But guys, I got a potential breaking news story. So let me jump on Again? this. And, uh, we'll talk. Yeah, I just don't want to miss the call. Go All right, ahead. there you go. John Rothstein, CBS. Good morning. <laughs> oh, my God, please don't unmute John, yourself. John, <laughs> uh, mute yourself. John, mute yourself. He muted it. Hop off the Zoom, John. No, Moose, no. <laughs> 